All right, one of the things I got to talk about off grid use with power tools. Now, if you can use cordless tools, that's great. And there's there's modern cordless tools here where when you especially in a Ryobi side, you get these P108 batteries, you can take some otherwise mediocre power tools, make them actually pretty powerful. Uh, DeWalt good tools out of the out of the starting gate. There's nothing you need to hot rod or modify on those. Their, uh, their batteries don't last very long, but they are powerful. They dump a lot of power in a short period of time. The main reason why anybody doing off-grid capable power tool usage has to look at more than one power tool product line is because no single product line makes everything, okay? Um, uh, DeWalt does not make a, a portable chop saw. Uh, Ryobi does not make a big lantern like that, a job site light. Uh, uh, Ryobi does not make a portable bandsaw like the, the DeWalt one here in this bag. Uh, but both companies make a vacuum. I could get a Ryobi vacuum, it's just that I happened to buy a DeWalt the day I bought one. But eventually you end up having to use some plug-in-the-wall tools. And for that, you have to use an inverter system. And with that, you're going to probably just going to use conventional batteries. Now, I have tried doing this with deep cycle Trojan batteries and actually had the worst of luck. I just got back today from the recycle yard where I was dumping off those Trojan batteries. Um, really worthless for power tool usage on the off grid stuff. You got to use something that has cranking amps. Okay, that's that's motor, uh, batteries that are made to run a starter motor. The best of both worlds that I've been able to come up with are what they call these deep cycle, these marine RV, RV batteries. They're made um, to act as a deep cycle, but they, they compromise the design a little bit so that it's about 50% deep cycle, 50% cranking amp type battery. The issue with cranking amp batteries is that you got to keep that float charge up. Uh, if you run them up and down a lot, you're going to shorten the life. These batteries, kind of a halfway in between type of thing. Really good for this kind of application though, because you need the cranking amps. I'm probably going to get a second battery to double up that system. One of the things to consider on those is they tend to run just under 100 bucks each. You got some issues with uh, core trade in. But, um, you know, when we look at that compared to lithium ion, okay, that lithium ion battery right there, that, that new model Ryobi P108 4 amp battery costs more than a big honking lead acid battery, okay? So, when you're doing this, it's, it's almost like adding another rechargeable tool system. Even, even by the time we got to put some quick detach cables and modify this, maybe a little cart, I'm probably going to be pulling a whole bunch of this stuff out and making it where it's a little modular cart that wheels out of there for the, uh, the power system. With a 2000 watt inverter, I can run most handheld electrical power tools, except these power saws don't want to do it. Okay, that's a 15 amp motor on there, doesn't really want to do it. The other thing you're going to have is that with any of these inverters, it's not true sine wave power. It's not exactly the same as what you get from the power company. Because of that long-term usage, you're going to shorten the life of some of the motors in some of these tools. And because of that, I don't use higher-end plug-in-the-wall type tools. This is, this is a name brand, this, but, but I've owned it for several years, too. I've owned this saw for over 10 years. When I'm getting other plug-in-a-wall stuff, because a lot of times I am running it off an inverter, I'm not going to go for the higher brand. I'll go for something that's capable and has a good warranty. That usually means a Harbor Freight stuff. A Harbor Freight stuff isn't bad, okay? It's, it, it's okay. And because I run the risk of burning stuff up or not quite being happy with running on inverter power, a little easier for me to deal with these guys on Harbor Freight than some of the other companies. So on a relatively low amperage tool, I, I've got this sander, I featured it a little bit in another video. A lot of the real tool snobs don't like it because it's a little underpowered. I like it because it's a little underpowered um, for sharpening stuff. 
if I run my hand up onto that thing, it's no big deal, okay? It's not going to rip my skin off or anything like that. The, uh, the inverter is a 2,000 watt inverter, can handle 4,000 watts of surge. I really like these little power cords that have the lights in them. I just happen to get a good deal on that rigid I, uh, brand. I, I, there's no real brand loyalty you got to worry too much about on power cords. But I, I do kind of like the rigid stuff. The thing I like is that little light on the end that tells me that the thing's on. Because if we overload the inverter, let's say I, I've got this saw plugged in right now and I go to turn it on, the guard's in place, I turn it on. It only runs momentarily because that starting surge of power actually has to go for a little bit. It's, it's not an instantaneous thing. And if it can't hold that for three to five seconds, it's, it's not going to run that tool. Okay. So what happens, you pull the trigger, it does something, kind of hesitates a little bit. The other thing you got to look out for is it can actually do some weird shit with the polarity of the magnets inside these tools and uh, magnetically lock them. Now usually you can undo that just by hand kicking the thing and kind of undoing that little bit of magnetism. But supposedly what happens is that builds up over time and kind of screws with the motor. One of the motors I have where that started to become an issue is uh, this one right here. So starting this thing up What's going to happen? I turn it on. I get a little hesitation. That's because that, the machine had reset when uh, it, it, it had reset when the uh, I try to use this. So we got light. We go to turn this on. It's probably not going to be instantaneous. Okay. Well, there it went. But you notice there was a little bit of hesitation. It was a little bit of hesitation at first. So sometimes you just got to kick that with your hand to get it going. If it's a uh, table saw. Obviously that gets a little bit tricky, but there are ways to do it um, You just stick a little piece of wood out there kick the blade a little get it started And then let it warm up let it build up its speed before you try to cut the wood on um, this 11 amp grinder uh, Which I didn't think it was going to be able to handle um, we're, uh, we're getting full power which is good so realize that with this 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 machine here i think it was 60 70 bucks over at harbor freight about 120 ish 130 ish for the inverter 100 uh no it was under 100 bucks for that battery maybe 30 40 bucks for all the wiring and cable and um so what that does is that turns some higher powered tools into off-grid capable now obviously it doesn't really turn them into cordless okay um, the cords and the distance that we can operate from the trailer might be limited and that's where having this system built into a little cart is probably eventually going to work better than having it work in a trailer so I, I don't know if I'm going to redo all of this but basically probably rebuild this cabinet so that the, the whole power thing goes in on a little cart into that little alcove and what you don't want to do in these situations, if you have to operate a little bit further away from your mobile workshop thing, is you, you want to be able to move your batteries and everything out there to the tool, if at all possible, and limit the lengths of the cords that you're going to use. I, I had to replace my whole battery pack here. I did have some Trojan Deep Cycle 6-volt batteries out on the tongue of the trailer. And just that wire run of being about uh, four foot longer than the wire runs that I have right there was enough to really destroy the efficiency of the system. In fact, I, I had to take those batteries out to the recycle and they're only seven years old. So battery choice and just the lengths of the cables in an off-grid system can mean a difference, a huge difference just in battery life, equipment efficiency. 12 volt power is very cable sensitive. It's one of the reasons why, as much as Nikola Tesla really thought it was cool to use DC power on a lot of stuff, the people who actually made the financial decisions in the power industry said, no, you, you, can't, you can't make DC power reliable enough to uh, have a, a major power grid running on it. You, have to actually, you would have to have a source of new energy within every 40 foot. 
if you're going to do a DC power power grid, you, you almost have to run solar panels or some sort of a power generation device at every power pole. Uh, if you're further apart than that, you're going to lose a lot of efficiency in your stuff. So I, I switched to a shorter cable run, which gave me the whole idea that probably the better way to do this in the future is to do it all in some sort of a cart or hand truck type thing. And uh, it is kind of upper middle size on a off-grid power system. Here you can see I'm using one of these net meter solar charge controllers to uh, regulate the solar power. The reason, if, if you can see it in the picture there, there's a little moon symbol on there. It's because there's not enough power being generated by the panels right now for the unit to measure. And I, I just got to wait till some better weather before I can see what's going on. It might be a little issue with the controller. I don't know yet. Um, and then I've, I've wired in this, this light here, which uh, I, I got to do a bunch of work in here. I got to basically put some different interior paneling in and some different outlets. But remember, cable thickness is kind of an issue with 12 volt. Thicker is going to be more efficient, but the length of the cable run uh, is a major issue. You cannot uh, always overcome the power transmission problems by going with a thicker cable. We had double odd cable originally running from the Trojan batteries to, this, to the inverter location here, and it wasn't good enough. Short cable runs make up for other issues that some people try to solve with thicker cables. You try to shorten that cable run if you can. And then realize the other advice I'm giving uh, when you're talking about plug in wall power tools. Because these inverters don't push pure sine wave power, even the ones they call pure sine wave power are you know, not necessarily all that good for power tools. You're going to shorten the life of power tool motors when you run them on um, these types of inverters. They can get magnetically locked and get a little goofy like this one has. And you, you don't want to use high-end stuff with that, okay? You go Harbor Freight, you know, buy the extended warranty if you feel you need to. Uh, don't, don't go high-end on these. If you're going to go high-end on something, save that for your cordless. On the plug-in-the-wall stuff, that, that uh, what I'm finding is that the non-name brand or the Harbor Freight brand stuff it cuts just as well, it grinds just as well, it drills just as well. Um, I'm not seeing a justification for higher cost on name brand plug-in tools with uh, off-grid stuff. I, I'm not seeing it. Okay, I'll, I see it with shop stuff where you're going to plug in a regular grid power i see a difference i don't i don't know if it's a big difference there's a little bit of a difference but remember all this stuff is made in china anyway and but on cordless yeah there's differences in name brands uh the ryobi stuff not real good but when you start using those those new batteries in these things like that one then it's a whole different world and it's definitely worth considering so this is a little bit more of a primer on uh, the off-grid workshop. When I get this thing all built and nicer, we'll be doing uh, more videos with it.